Welcome everybody. Uh, it's really good to have you. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to be here with us. Uh, I'm Bo. I'm from Vision Australia's digital access team uh, and I'm joined by my colleagues from digital access. Josh who will be taking us through uh, designing for everyone, an introduction to inclusive design uh, and Deb who will be helping support the presentation as well. Uh, this is our first webinar for the year, so we're really excited for this one and uh, really glad that you could all be here to share it with us. Uh, before we get started, just some housekeeping. Uh, the presentation will run for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have some questions. We've already had a lot of questions submitted to us, so we'll answer as many of those as we can in the time we have. And there's also a QA and a button where it looks like there's already a question <laughs> in there. So you can add your questions on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and we'll try our best to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation as well. And try to keep your questions in there rather than chat. Uh, but by all means, go into the chat and have a conversation um, and a discussion about this topic. And if there's any help or support you need during the presentation as well, just chuck it in the chat and we'll help you as best we can. Uh, also, we've got auto live transcripts running if you need a text alternative for this presentation. Uh, there's a drop down button next to the text that says live towards the top of the screen. Uh, you can press that and you can click on to go to the custom live streaming service and that will open up the live transcript in your browser. Uh, you can also choose to copy the link to that service and paste it in a browser of your choice if you'd rather do it that way. Uh, and when that page opens, it might ask you to log in or sign in, but you don't have to do that. You can just dismiss that dialogue and then you've got the live transcript there for you. And we'll pay, uh, post the details in the chat for that as well. And if you need any support with the live transcripts, post that in the chat and we'll help you. Uh, and lastly, we'll be recording this webinar and we'll post the link out to all the attendees uh, when it's uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, and okay, that does it from me, so we can get started. Um, Josh is our senior design consultant in the digital access team at Vision Australia. Uh, he leads all of our inclusive design services and he also runs our inclusive design training course as well. Uh, and so with that, I hand it over to you, Josh, for the good bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bo, yeah, and thanks for the um, nice introduction. Um, really appreciate everyone taking some time out of their busy schedules. Um, I can see we've just hit over 140 people. Um, so really excited to, to have you here today. Um, so today's webinar, we're going to be looking at designing for everyone, uh, an introduction to inclusive design. Um, a bit about my background first. Um, so as Bo said, I lead all of the design consulting services at uh, Vision Australia um, in the digital access team and um, also run the uh, training course on inclusive design. Um, my background's in user experience design and when I first took this role roughly four years ago, um, I kind of thought I knew pretty much everything there was to know about design. And um, being in this role, what it's really taught me is actually how little I knew uh, about design. And I'm constantly learning things. Um, I learn a new thing almost every day um, in terms of how I could design better products uh, and services. Oops. Uh, so I thought we'd begin with uh, a chair and the story behind a chair. Uh, so up on the screen, I have uh, what's called the Aeron chair, uh, a chair created by Herman Miller uh, and sold by Herman Miller. Uh, this is one of the most popular office chairs uh, on the market. Um, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, I think it was, it was first released in 1994. And uh, it's actually an early example of uh, inclusive design uh, as well. Um, the Wyatt had an article they brought out a couple of years ago, um, where they said why the Aeron is still the most coveted seat in the office. Uh, it's also considered the design icon and uh, has a permanent place in the MoMA Museum uh, in New York. And finally, it's even uh, had, has been featured in The Simpsons. Um, so this is a really, really famous chair. Um, it's probably one of those well-known office chairs in the world. Uh, and you can always consider it kind of like the iPhone uh, of chairs. And uh, the two designers behind it, Don Chadwick and Bill Stumpf, 
uh, the process they went through to essentially create this chair and design it uh, was essentially an example of inclusive design. Um, they may not have used that terminology back in those days, um, but it is a really good example of um, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but the Aaron chair initially wasn't uh, the Aaron chair. Uh, its origins actually lie with a chair called the Sarah. Um, and this was a chair that Herman Miller released in 1988. Um, and it was specifically designed uh, more for a medical context. Uh, so for example, use in hospitals. Um, I think they, taught, they said they were sort of trying to design for the elderly, um, particularly the over 65 uh, age demographic. And I've got a photo of it uh, up in the slide. And there's a few things I'll, I'll point out. Um, so firstly, you might notice that uh, there's a side table uh, that's positioned very closely to the chair and also a shelf uh, on the left-hand side. And on the shelf, there's you know, photos, there's a vase of flowers, um, there's a coffee mug, some books. Um, and the thinking behind this was that uh, this chair, people would be sitting in for long periods of time. And so you need access to everything that was sort of important to you, whether it's um, yeah, a magazine to read or a book, um, or, your, or your coffee mug. Um, another thing I'll point out about the chair is that uh, something that's not so obvious uh, visually is that the, uh, the seat is essentially a slim piece of plastic um, with a thin cushion above it. And this was quite a controversial design at the time. Um, prior to that, the thinking was that if you wanted to design a comfortable chair, it had to have a thick foam cushion. And uh, what that meant was that uh, when people sat on it for long periods of time, the cushion would tend to get a bit hot. Uh, it didn't encourage airflow. And um, people could end up with things like bed sores um, and feeling rather uncomfortable uh, in the chair. Um, and that was quite controversial at the time for them to sort of say, no, we don't believe that. We think um, there's a better way to do this. Uh, to come up with sort of these ideas, uh, they, firstly, they engaged uh, some orthopedic specialists. You know, uh, who could provide some advice, some expert advice and um, experience on how to create a comfortable chair and what are the issues with the um, existing chairs. And they also did lots and lots of focus groups. Um, so Bill and Don were really big on doing research um, and, you know, trialing the chair, doing prototypes, getting people to sit on it for long periods of time uh, and getting their feedback and then sort of making improvements uh, over time. And uh, internally at Herman Miller, the team loved this chair. Uh, I've taken a quote from uh, Gary Miller, who headed their R&D department at the time, and he said that people became emotionally attached to that chair. They absolutely loved it. But Herman Miller couldn't figure out how to sell it. So they ended up killing this error. They discontinued it, not because it wasn't a good chair, people did, not because people didn't like it, more they just didn't know how to sell it. They didn't know how to take it to hospitals and... Um, or how to take it out to the market, uh, essentially to sell it. But that's not uh, the end of uh, this story. Uh, in fact, it's the beginning of the Aeron. Uh, so one forward a few years, and uh, Herman Miller was sort of starting to think, you know, computers are become, starting to become a bit of a thing. Um, so this is in the early 90s. And uh, people might actually need a chair to sit in front of the computer for, for long periods of time. Uh, and this chair is going to need to be really, really comfortable. Uh, so once again, they contacted Bill and Don, and they said, hey, you know that chair that you designed for us, uh, the Sarah, is there anything we could take for that to put into an office chair um, that people could sit on uh, in front of a computer for a long period of time? And Bill and Don said, yeah, absolutely. A lot of these innovations we can take from the Sarah, and we can put them in, into this office chair. Uh, so they started working on uh, this new chair, which um, has eventually become the Aeron. And the product went through loads and loads of iterations. And once again, uh, being Bill and Don, they did lots and lots of research as well. Um, so they got lots of different types of body shapes and sizes uh, to sit in the chair. Um, there's a story of they got a woman who was four foot 11 and she sat in the chair. It was comfortable for her, but she couldn't adjust the chair very easily. Um, and they said, no, this is not good enough. We want a chair that's comfortable for everybody. And uh, essentially they sort of went to redesign how it's adjusted and sort of other mechanics of the chair. And that set production back a year. So they canceled production um, for a year just to resolve that particular issue for that, for that woman. 
And uh, once again, they also engage some specialists as well as some orthopedic specialists to, um, to advise them around this as well. Uh, eventually they got to a chair they were happy with and uh, it was released in 1994, uh, April 26, 1994. And there was a patent lodged against it as well uh, for the error. I've taken a, a quote from a Fast Company article uh, about the chair um, where it says, one dealer in Hollywood shortly after its unveiling in October of 1994 reported putting his first floor sample in the window and hearing cars screech to a halt upon seeing it. This chair was an absolute overnight success. It looked really different to any of the other chairs and uh, people really loved sitting on it as well. And if we sort of move forward to today, uh, this chair is in lots of offices around the world. Um, essentially, it's still the most uh, popular office chair uh, out there. Um, even my previous role uh, before joining Vision Australia, we had Aeron chairs uh, in the office. Uh, but one interesting thing I think about this chair is that most of the people sitting on it um, or the people buying it won't know that it was actually a lot of the innovations and the reason it's so comfortable were because uh, of the Sarah, a chair designed for the elderly um, and for, you know, to be put in hospitals uh, in, in a medical context. So you might be uh, thinking, you know, maybe that's a, like a good story. It's a nice story, um, maybe cherry picked to illustrate an example of inclusive design. Um, but, you know, how many other products have actually been sort of through this process um, to be designed? And the answer is actually countless products have. There are a lot of products on the market where their starting point was uh, maybe a particular segment of the population um, or what we'd be focusing on today um, where it's people with disabilities. Um, so another example of that is the OXO Good Grips product range. Um, so for, for example, their peeler uh, was initially designed for a woman called Betsy who has arthritis. Um, or we have the measuring cup, uh, which I've got up on the screen. And uh, that's a really good measuring cup because you can look at the level from the sides um, as with traditional measuring cups, um, but you can also see the level from above as well. Um, and the thinking behind this was that um, for some people, bending their knees is actually quite painful. Um, so once again, it could be arthritis, um, it could be a person with Parkinson's disease, um, or it could just be anybody. Um, I actually have this measuring cup in our kitchen and uh, I really like not having to bend my knees uh, to be able to check the level. Uh, another example is easy open packaging. Uh, so on the screen, I've got a picture of a Kellogg's uh, cornflakes packet, and uh, it's what's got a certification called easy to open uh, certified. Um, this is a certification that Arthritis Australia provides. Um, they have a division called the Accessible Design Division, um, focusing on easy to open packaging, um, particularly for people with arthritis. Um, but lots of other people benefit from easy to open packaging as well. Um, I think about, I uh, just had a baby a few weeks ago and um, think about sometimes you're holding a baby and you might need to open a packet and how much better it is when it's just really easy to open. Um, a really bad scenario is where you might have to use scissors uh, to open the packaging. And uh, from my understanding, some people actually end up in hospital or in ac having accidents because they cut themselves uh, trying to open packaging. Um, so this is another example of uh, inclusive design we're starting off with people with arthritis. Uh, we're actually creating a better solution for everyone. Uh, another example is captions. So if we sort of go back 10, 15 years ago, uh, captions were a requirement uh, in the WCAG standards, um, but they've become incredibly popular, uh, particularly in the last few years, um, and particularly since uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can do a pretty good job of uh, auto transcribing video. Um, so I've got a TED, picture of a TED talk up on the screen and a person can choose to uh, turn the captions on. Um, and that could be for a number of reasons. It could be that they are deaf or, or hard of hearing, um, or maybe they, are, for example, in my shoes, you're feeding a baby, it's the middle of the night, you wanna watch a little bit of Netflix, um, you turn the volume down and you put the captions on. Um, or I've heard that when people watch, uh, you know, learning videos or, you know, they're at school, and um, they watch a video and it's got captions. Some people say that they can take in the information better. Um, so lots and lots and lots of people uh, are benefiting from captions. 
And uh, The Guardian even had an article they uh, brought out uh, in 2019 where they asked the question, is it time captions became the norm? Um, because they have become so popular. And a lot of people are starting to watch video um, with the volume down or with no volume at all. Um, so this is another example of uh, inclusive design. It started off as being a good solution for people who are deaf or hard, have hard of hearing or are hard of hearing. And um, we end up with a, a solution that a lot of people uh, are benefiting from. Um, we also have curb cuts. Uh, so these became a requirement uh, for people in wheelchairs so that they could get over gutters. Uh, but lots of other people benefit as well. Um, it could be a person wheeling a pram. Um, it might be a child riding a, a bike. Um, it could be somebody wheeling luggage. Uh, we all kind of benefit from curb cuts. And I imagine a world that didn't have curb cuts, we'd be kind of tripping on the gutters as well. Um, just wouldn't be you know, as easy to, to navigate around the neighborhood. Um, so this is another example of uh, inclusive design. And it's actually had a, an effect named after it as well, uh, which is the curb cut effect. Uh, and that essentially states that laws and products designed for people with disabilities often end up benefiting everyone. And I've seen this many times. Um, I've shown you just a few examples now, um, but uh, this is a, a, a thing that is um, very easy to illustrate. Um, we often all benefit uh, from these solutions. And there's a really good TED talk uh, you might like to watch after uh, this webinar by Elise Roy. Um, it's a few years old uh, and it's titled, When We Design for Disability, We All Benefit. Um, and she'll, she talks about some other examples uh, in that presentation too. Uh, so what is inclusive design? I've taken a quote uh, from Susan Goltzman, who was a professor really influential in this space. Um, she focused on designing children's playgrounds, um, but a lot of her thinking has sort of been um, taken in, into other disciplines and into other areas of design. Uh, and she said, it doesn't mean you're designing one thing for all people. It means you're designing a diversity of ways for people to participate in an experience so that everyone has a sense of belonging. And what does she kind of mean by that? Well, if you take a device uh, like a Kindle, uh, for example, um, this is a device that's been created for people to read books. Um, now a person can read a book using their eyes. Uh, they can also listen to it. And um, in that case, they, maybe they're blind or maybe they are just tired or maybe they're sitting on a train and the train's vibrating and it's um, easier for them to read, to listen to the book rather than read it with their eyes. You can also do things like adjust the text size. You can change the font. Um, you can really customize it uh, around your needs and preferences. Um, and what, what this device is doing is, is it's providing a diverse range of ways to be able to read a book. Uh, whereas previously, if you had say a paperback book, um, if you were blind, you had to rely maybe on a audio book version of that book. Um, back then, not every book had an audio version. Um, you might have to you know, purchase a CD as well and put in a CD player. And um, these days you can just essentially read the same book as everybody else, um, but you can customize it to your needs and, and consume it um, based on your, your needs and preferences. Uh, or another example is uh, some of the newer Samsung dish, uh, washing machines and dishwashers. Um, so they have a traditional control panel that you can press with your fingers. Uh, you can also control it with your phone uh, which means that you can use a screen reader. Um, say, for example, if you're blind, to potentially control the uh, washing machine. And you can also use your voice as well to control them. So some of them have voice control built into them. And once again, that's a diverse range of ways to use this product. Uh, now you can use it with your fingers. Um, you can use it through your phone, and you might have some kind of assistive technology on it. Um, or you can use it with your voice too. And that could be a person who's you know, in a wheelchair, it could be a person who doesn't have the use of any of their arms or hands. Um, lots of people can benefit as well from uh, voice control. Uh, so inclusive design is a methodology. Um, well, that's the way I like to look at it. Uh, it's a design methodology where recognizing exclusion is the starting point. Um, so if you think about the Aeron uh, chair by Herman Miller, 
uh, they actually looked at that woman who was four foot 11. Um, she couldn't adjust the chair without getting out of the chair. Um, how could they redesign it so that she would be able to adjust it without um, having to actually get out of the chair? Uh, one of the key uh, principles around inclusive design is that there's no such thing as average. Uh, and there's a professor out of uh, Harvard University, Todd Rose, he's working in the education space, uh, but he put a, a book out a few years ago on that. There's an accompanying TED talk, uh, you can Google as well, uh, where he basically cites all this research and um, these case studies where there's no such really thing as an average person. Uh, one of the case studies he cites is uh, cockpits in planes in the 50s. Uh, they were sort of designed uh, in a, for a particular body shape and size, and lots of pilots were complaining, you know, they couldn't uh, steer the plane very well. And when they took a sample size of 4,000 different people and uh, looked at their measurements, such as height, their weight, um, their shoulders, and they averaged them out, what they found was that there was nobody who was uh, actually the average uh, on those dimensions. We're all pretty unique. Um, some people were taller, some people were shorter, um, and this is the reason why the planes were, were poorly designed. And even when they brought it down to just three dimensions, so say, for example, it could have been you know, shoulders, your height, and maybe your legs, uh, I think it was still only you know, a very small percentage of people were actually the average, even based off three different dimensions. Um, so that led to sort of some thinking, okay, we can't really design a cockpit for the average person because there's no such thing as an average person. Um, what we need to do is, is create a cockpit that people can adjust based on their dimensions. So now you can adjust the steering wheel, you can move it up and down or pull it forward or push it backwards. Um, you can adjust the seat. Um, you can really adjust this cockpit so that it uh, meets your needs and your body shape. And that innovation has sort of been rolled out into other areas as well. So for example, cars now, we, when we hop into a car, we can adjust that seat um, and potentially the steering wheel in some cars uh, to our dimensions so that we can drive more safely. Uh, another principle is that the 20% can provide some of the most important information to create better products. Um, and I've got a photo I've put on this slide to illustrate that of LeBron James and uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew's uh, got cerebral palsy and he was unable to tie his shoelaces up. Um, and Nike worked with him uh, and LeBron James to uh, create a shoe, design a shoe that was laceless technology called the Flyies technology. And uh, these two people in the photo, Matthew and LeBron James, are the, an example of what some people call uh, the extremes. Um, so Matthew has cerebral palsy, unable to tie his shoelaces up. And LeBron James is sort of at the other end of the spectrum. He's an extreme athlete, um, one of the best basketballers uh, ever. And they've utilized these two people to create a shoe. Um, and they sort of both sit in, inside the 20%. Um, so these, uh, the 20% can actually provide some of the most important insights uh, into our designs. They can sort of look at our designs from maybe a different perspective we hadn't considered and uh, make our designs more robust uh, and uh, better quality. And Nike have continued to invest in this. So they had the Fly's laceless shoe. It, I think it used like a Velcro type um, scenario. Um, you still needed a hand. Um, you still need to be able to touch the shoe to be able to put it on. And I saw about a week ago, they've actually now continued further with that work and they've released a hands-free shoe. Um, so you literally don't have to touch the shoe with your hands at all uh, to be able to put them on. You can just put your foot uh, into the shoe and it'll be tight and, and snug. Uh, in the shoe. Um, and who knows where they'll take this. So their starting point was Matthew. How can we create a shoe that where you don't have to you know, type your shoelaces for Matthew? And they've ended up with this kind of innovation. And you know maybe they'll roll it out. Maybe there's a particular types of jobs where people need to be able to put their shoes on without touching it with their hands. Maybe the general public just actually would really love shoes. They don't have to tie up. Um, who knows where they'll go with this? Um, but this is another really, really good example of inclusive design. They've started off with the 20% and they've ended up with a really, really uh, innovative product. Uh, the next principle is that flexibility is key. So we can't 
design things in a sense that it's a one size fits all in, in most scenarios. Um, even the air on chair, uh, I think they estimate it was around 95% of the population who could sit in the chair and adjust it. Um, subsequently, a few years ago when they remastered it, they've now got three different sizes uh, because they set the objective that they wanted 100% of people to be able to sit in this chair and uh, adjust it. Um, it's really, really important that our designs are flexible because there's going to be unforeseen circumstances or scenarios that we just are unaware of, so we haven't considered. Uh, another example of that I think of is uh, with COVID-19. Um, there's been a real push rolling out uh, touch screens. Um, and touch screens, you know, in kiosks and um, at checkouts and things like that, they can be problematic, uh, for example, for people who are blind, for some people who are blind. Uh, whereas now we've got a scenario where lots of people don't want to use the touch screen because, you know, has it been sanitized? Uh, is it clean? But there's really no fallback. You've got to be able to use the touch screen. You, the only option you've got is, is to use this touch screen. So flexibility is really key. We need to uh, build flexibility into our designs for, for un, unforeseen circumstances. Uh, and the final principle is that for organizers, for organizations to survive, they must adapt. Um, so a big part of inclusive design is learning. Uh, I think this particular idea and this particular sort of area of design, it's still sort of at its very early stages. And we're still kind of figuring out how we can actually um, how can we actually do it and how we can practice it. So we really need uh, a growth mindset. We need to be learning, you know, learning from other design disciplines, um, learning from other solutions that people have created um, to figure out how we can actually um, put this into practice. And this is going to be really, really important for organizations to survive as well. And you look at a lot of the, the big companies overseas, and it's starting to happen in Australia as well, where they're starting to take um, accessibility very, very seriously for people with disabilities. Whether it's Nike, uh, in the example I had with the, um, the shoe, the hands-free shoe, or whether it's um, you know, your Googles and your Apples as well. Um, they're all starting to take this, this very, very seriously because they see it's, it's imperative for their survival. So what are the benefits of uh, practicing inclusive design? Uh, well, firstly, more people will be able to use and experience the product or service. And I think anybody who's sort of practicing design, that, you know, that's going to be a good outcome. Um, who wants to be creating products and, and things that some people are unable to use? Uh, it's also going to be a source of innovation. Um, so that example, I've sort of showed two examples where there's been a lot of innovation, the Nike shoe example uh, or the Aeron chair. Uh, it also, from a risk perspective, helps organizations avoid legal risks and the cost of remediation. Um, so if you create, say, a product or a service and a person who has a disability is unable to use it uh, because of their disability, uh, they have a, the right to lodge a complaint uh, through the Human Rights Commission and, um, you know, it could end up in court, um, it could end up in the media, uh, and the cost of the remediation can often be quite expensive. So if we can kind of factor these things earlier on in our design processes, then um, there's less risk that we're going to create a problem later on. There's also the curb cut effect where we all benefit. So a lot of the times everybody's going to benefit or a lot more people than maybe we initially envisage, we initially envisage will, will benefit from our design solution uh, when we practice inclusive design. Uh, and finally, and I think this isn't taught enough as a point um, around inclusive design is that it will help you attract and maintain talent. Um, so a lot of people want to do work that they feel is doing good for the world. And uh, if you're working for an organization that say doesn't value uh, things like you know, making products and services accessible to people with disabilities, then some people are just going to say, actually, I just want to leave. Like this leaves me with a bit of a bad taste. Um, I don't really like that feeling. Um, whereas if you can uh, encourage your organization to practice inclusive design and start to think about these things, then you're likely to attract um, and maintain this talent. They'll stay on because they'll be proud of their work and um, they feel like they're putting something good uh, out into the world. Uh, so what is a disability? Uh, I've taken a quote from the World Health Organization. Uh, and the quote says, in recent years, the understanding of disability has moved away from a physical or medical perspective 
to one that takes into account a person's physical, social, and political context. Today, disability is understood to arise from the interaction between a person's health condition or impairment and the multitude of influencing factors in their environment. And there's a term that uh, one of the really prominent figures in this space, Kat Holmes uses, Kat Holmes uses um, and that's the term mismatch. Um, and what she says is, is that um, essentially disability can be looked at through the lens of it's a mismatch between the design of something, whether it's a product or you know, something in the physical environment, for example, and uh, the person themselves. Um, and an example of that is uh, a person in a wheelchair and some stairs. Um, so stairs are not going to be a great solution um, for the person in the wheelchair. Um, so there's a bit of a mismatch between the design of that and the person in the wheelchair. Uh, whereas a ramp, for example, might be a better solution or a lift uh, for the person in the wheelchair and, and a much, much better match. Uh, one in five Australians have disability uh, and they can be loosely categorised into disabilities that relate to vision, uh, disabilities that relate to hearing, uh, disabilities that relate to speech. Uh, there's disabilities that relate to physical and motor. Um, so an example of that is um, arthritis. Uh, there's disabilities that can be cognitive, they can be learning disabilities or neurological. Um, so an example of a neurological disability is epilepsy. Uh, and there's also disabilities that relate to mental health as well. Um, so it could be post-traumatic stress disorder uh, is an example of that. Um, so one in five Australians have a disability. It's 25% of the pop, so 20% of the population. Um, it's quite a significant uh, proportion uh, of Australians. Uh, and this number is expected to grow uh, as well. With an aging population, uh, there are a number of disabilities that are linked to aging. Um, for example, vision is often linked to aging. Um, so it's, it's expected this number will grow as well uh, in Australia. Uh, there's also a model of disability that Microsoft put out uh, a number of years ago uh, in their inclusive design toolkit. Um, and they call that the persona spectrum. And they say that we can actually frame disabilities as permanent, uh, temporary, and situational. Um, so an example of that could be uh, a person who's deaf. Um, that might be a permanent scenario for them. Um, then you might have a temporary uh, kind of form where a person might have an ear infection, where they've, uh, they can't hear, maybe if they're watching a video, say on a website or a person presenting on stage. Um, and then you have a situational kind of equivalent, which it could be a bartender in a noisy pub. Um, and they all share the, the same characteristic that um, say if they're trying to watch a video, might be YouTube or something on their phone, um, they might be unable to hear it or unable to hear it very well. Um, and in that instance, we can start to think about, okay, what's gonna be a good solution for them? Maybe it's captioning, maybe it could be a person signing, we're talking about a person who's deaf. Um, we can sort of think about what, how we could design a solution for them. Um, this is a really, really powerful model um, because it kind of illustrates the curb cut effect and how we can all benefit. You can start off with, you know, how can we create a solution for the person who's deaf? And then we find out that lots of other people benefit as well. Um, could be on a temporary basis, um, or it could be on a situational basis uh, as well. Uh, when we're practicing inclusive design, uh, it's also important to be aware of assistive technologies. Um, so there's hundreds of technologies that are out there that uh, people with disabilities use. Um, I've just put up a few examples uh, on the screen. Uh, for example, we have a Braille note. Uh, what this does is, is it outputs web pages in Braille form. Um, so a person who could read Braille can uh, read what's on the, the screen with their hands. Um, you've got voice control, um, and that's built into a lot of our operating systems these days. Um, for example, on the Mac, uh, they have quite a powerful um, voice control, and that could be used by a person uh, with a form of physical disability. Uh, you have switch controls. Uh, these are the four colored buttons I've, I've got up on the screen. I've got a, a blue button, a red button, and yellow button and a green button. And uh, these can be used in lots of different ways. Sometimes it might be a person using it with their elbow. Um, some people use switch controls uh, with their mouth to control the, the cursor on the screen. Um, or some people even use it you know, with the side of their head. 
Um, so that's another way of interacting with technology. Or we even have something as similar as Grammarly, which is often isn't classified as an assistive technology, um, but there are people with learning disabilities that, that really benefit from it. Um, for example, some people with dyslexia who might have trouble spelling their words correctly. Um, Grammarly can really help them with that. Okay, so how to get started with uh, inclusive design. Uh, so firstly, you want to tell the why story for your organisation. You need to figure out what's going to grab the interest of the leadership team um, and also your, your wider colleagues. Um, so that's really going to depend on the organisation itself. Uh, but you can use tools such as things like case studies. So you can talk about, for example, the Aeron chair or Nike with their shoe. Um, you can talk about expanding the market and maybe you could show them the persona spectrum to illustrate the curb cut effect that, you know, we've got one in five Australians who have a disability, but then there's also lots of other people who might also benefit. So maybe we're talking about, you know, three out of five people might benefit from our solution. Uh, and there's also direct customer feedback. So sometimes you might be in what we call the lucky position in some ways um, to actually have some direct customer feedback on how you could maybe design your products or how you could customize them um, to better meet your customers' needs. Uh, another thing you can do is planning lunch and learn sessions um, and create online channels for discussion. Um, so you might bring in a person with lived experience of disability uh, to do a lunch and learn session um, about some of the challenges they come up against uh, in life. Um, you can also create an online channel in, say, if your organisation has something like Teams, uh, where you can sort of start to promote and um, talk about accessibility uh, inside the organisation. Uh, secondly, you want to broaden your team's awareness of disabilities and assistive technologies. Uh, so uh, one thing you can do is, is organise people with disabilities to come in and speak to your team. Um, once again, they can provide that lived experience perspective and they can tell lots of interesting stories. Um, I always learn new things uh, when uh, people come in and talk about some of the challenges uh, they come up against. Um, you can also learn about the different ways people interact with your services and products. So start to look at you know, different assistive technologies. That could be looking on YouTube. Um, there's some really great videos. Um, Apple have some fantastic videos um, about some of the settings they have on software and their devices. Um, Microsoft the Inclusive Design Toolkit includes a bunch of videos of different ways that people um, use technology. So really try to learn and um, share what you're learning as well uh, with your colleagues. Uh, thirdly, uh, you want to equip, equip team members with the tools and processes. Um, so some of the things you want to do is uh, define who's responsible for what. So don't just say, oh, we're just going to leave it to the QA testers and they can just sort of test it and make sure it's okay. Um, it really needs to be the responsibility of pretty much everyone inside the organization, um, whether it's a product manager, whether it's a product owner, whether it's a project manager thinking about procurement and requirements, whether it's a designer when they're actually doing their designs or prototyping, um, the QA tester when they're doing their testing, the developer when they're writing the code, everybody pretty much has responsibility. If communications teams when they're writing content um, into thinking about this. Um, you also want to define where accessibility fits into your workflow. So sometimes, uh, quite often the way accessibility is done is, is we'll test at the end. Um, that's going to mean we end up with you know, remediation work. And often we end up with not the best solutions. They'll kind of be more Band-Aid fixes. Um, so you want to try to bring accessibility forward. Um, sometimes people use that uh, the term shift left to describe that. Uh, but basically you want to start thinking about it probably even before a project begins. Um, you want to look at what tools your team can use. So there's lots of free tools that are available out there. There's uh, color, lots of color contrast analyzers that can help you test the contrast of your colors. Um, Vision Australia has one that we, we use um, and provide for free, um, but there's lots of other ones out there too. Um, there's the Star Color Blindness Simulator. So that can, that's available for Figma and uh, Adobe Experience Design uh, as a plugin. And that lets you sort of look at things from a color vision perspective. Um, for some people who can't maybe perceive the difference between red and green. Uh, you can also uh, use a tool called uh, CoffeeScript, which is primarily for web pages. 
Um, that has lots of vision simulators. Um, there's lots of things we can, we can do. Even with the OXO Good Groups products, I know they, uh, they're more of a physical product, um, but they actually would um, you dip their hands in olive oil um, to make them really slippery, and then they'd try to use the kitchen tools uh, as a way of, sort of trying to simulate what the experience might be like uh, for a person who has arthritis. Uh, you can also uh, provide places people can go for information. Uh, and this is particularly important when you onboard new staff members, uh, basically providing them with the knowledge and the tools and um, information so that they can sort of take that and um, apply it in, in their work as well. Uh, four, include people with disabilities in user research studies. So it's really, really important that you kind of don't make assumptions and uh, include people with a range of disabilities uh, in your research. Um, that could be if you're doing customer interviews, it could be if you're doing usability testing. Um, the idea is, is you really kind of want to get their feedback uh, directly um, rather than making assumptions yourself. And you want to get regular feedback too. Uh, so some organisations in Australia are starting to establish panels where they um, have a regular group of people they can go out to. Uh, and when you do the user research, you also want to share the findings widely uh, using a variety of modes. So you might write an in internal blog post, um, you might post a video onto your teams, whatever works best uh, inside your organisation. Uh, five, uh, it's really important that you employ people with disabilities. Uh, this is one of the most powerful things that you can do. Um, when you employ people with disabilities, they're going to be very valuable. They're going to advocate potentially for uh, considering accessibility. Um, they can educate staff and, and their colleagues around them. Uh, and also they can offer different perspectives in uh, product and service decisions. And I really hope that some organizations start to employ people with disabilities, not only sort of to test and sort of validate solutions or provide feedback, but actually to be the decision maker, um, the design decision maker. And the reason for this is, is that it's very different um, if you have skin in the game than if you don't have skin in the game. Um, and they can, they've got a lot more to gain by um, promoting accessibility inside the organization. Uh, six, you want to communicate the story. Uh, so I recommend communicating the story internally and hopefully that can make it up to your leadership team uh, and then externally for the really big wins. Um, and you want to showcase and celebrate your wins as well. Um, so it's really, really important that we start to uh, document case studies and document the work we're doing uh, so that other people can be aware of it um, and also learn from it too. Uh, and finally, uh, you want to learn, be curious and practice. Um, so I talked a little bit earlier about uh, having a growth mindset and that uh, this is still really early, early field in, in, in some ways and we're still learning how to practice it. Um, so it's really, really important as designers to that we learn how to learn and we're constantly looking at how we can improve the way we do things. Um, there's no kind of like formula you can just apply to, to, to do this. I think we're still still figuring it out. Um, so try to become a design generalist as well. Look at other design disciplines. Um, you know, what are people doing in industrial design? What are they doing in the built environment? Um, so for example, I was looking at a uh, company out of New York that does landscape uh, design for public spaces. And um, they're doing lots of interesting things uh, in this space and coming up with lots of interesting solutions. Uh, you want to develop your observation skills. Um, this is a key skill to have as a designer anyway, but you'll notice lots of things when you start thinking, looking at things through an inclusive lens and you can start to observe how products could be designed better. Uh, you want to work on your listening skills uh, and you also want to put uh, in, it into practice what you've learned. Um, so experiment and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, like I said, this field's fairly new. And I think we're still figuring things out and we're going to make mistakes uh, as we go along. Um, the key is, is that you've really tried your best to take in different perspectives and needs um, when, you, when you practice design. And sort of at the end of the webinar now, and I'll finish up with a quote from Bill Stumpf, uh, the air and chair designer. Uh, and he said, design confronts reality. It doesn't try to hide things. Design advocates the future. And I think inclusive design is the current reality. Uh, 
And we need to really start factoring it in when we design things. Um, the last thing we wanted to do is, is not factor it in. And um, then there's a whole lot of remediation work we have to do later on when people maybe start complaining um, or uh, it just doesn't work out in the marketplace, whatever we've designed. So thank you for uh, sitting through the session. Um, but as I said, really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to listen to this webinar. Um, I should say we also run a uh, inclusive design course, but we go into this in much deeper detail. Um, but feel free to also to ask to contact me. My email address is up here if you have any questions um, or comments about the webinar as well. So we might now move on to a bit of a Q&A. Uh, as Bo said, uh, we did receive a bunch of questions prior to the session, which we might look at. And then um, uh, I think there's been some questions that have come up uh, during the session as well. Uh, so over yep. to you, Bo. All right, thanks, Josh. Uh, so the first question we had submitted previously was, uh, why do many designers think that inclusive design is restrictive? And they've added the comment that they think it's the wrong focus and that it should be about how to effectively communicate with their audience. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't, uh, obviously I, can't, I don't know exactly who these people are that are, that are saying it. Um, I think in the last few years, uh, designers have become a lot more aware of it. So I think awareness is one of the big issues. Um, I think uh, having some empathy as well. Um, so it's a lot different when you can actually see somebody who can't use something you've designed. Um, that can actually be a real sort of wake up call. Uh, there might be some designers who think it's affecting their creativity, um, but hopefully I've illustrated uh, through some of the case studies that it actually can be a really source of creative innovation. And I believe it, um, just makes you design things that are better because you're taking in all these other different perspectives. Uh, I had somebody attend my course uh, late last year and um, they were telling me that they had designed an app for hospitals. And um, what they discovered after they'd released the app was that a number of nurses were wanted to use dark mode on a device when they're walking through the car park because they felt unsafe. Um, and they had to do quite a bit of remediation work to be able to enable that. Um, whereas I think if they sort of factored that in, maybe they, they included nurses in their research, um, but dark mode as a um, supporting dark mode um, as part of the design would have been picked up as well for some people with vision loss. Um, so some people with vision loss um, see a lot of glare from screens and have to use dark mode um, to be able to see the screen. So it kind of just gets us taking these different perspectives that, that we're unaware of. Okay, next question. What are the top three reasons you find persuades organizations to take inclusive design seriously? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, it's obviously gonna depend on the organization. Um, for some organizations, it might be that a competitor is doing something. So um, for example, if you are in a competitive industry and one of your competitors um, starts to do a particular thing, then your CEO or your leadership team might be like, oh, we don't like it that they're out there doing this. We need to do something similar. Um, so one thing that comes to mind, don't know what happened in it, but I know when Coles released um, the quiet hour at, at their supermarkets. So that was originally created for, I think people who have autism, um, where they dim the lights and make the supermarkets a bit more quiet. And then I know my local Woolworths a few months later sort of rolled their one out. Um, so sometimes, yeah, there's the just competitive sides. Uh, second one is, uh, I think, yeah, you can use data and statistics. So whether it's um, trying to use the persona spectrum, talking about the number of people who have disabilities, talking about an aging population, that can some, sometimes be a good way to persuade an organization. Uh, or thirdly, there's the um, empathy side. So maybe if you're doing some usability testing or you've done some interviews, you could actually video that and uh, maybe show someone in your leadership team who can influence the organization. Um, I don't know there's three, but there's a fourth one. And I would say that is also just from a risk perspective. It's not one of ones I'm particularly a big fan of, but you could also mention, you know, this, there's a thing called the Disability Discrimination Act. And um, if people can't use our service or our product or whatever it is, or our website, then um, they do have the right to lodge a complaint. And this could be really bad news uh, for the organization. Okay, are there design techniques that help with ADD and ADHD? Yeah, there are a number of techniques. Um, I'll just mention one of them. 
uh, and that is uh, breaking things up into small pieces, information. So that could be a video, um, for example, say if you're um, running a training course, you might break it up into small little eight minute videos. That's a really, really good technique. Um, you can apply it to text content. So um, you could break it up into bullet points or into small chunks. Um, Any ways we can um, break up inf information into small pieces means that it's easier for people with ADD and ADHD to memorize and, and take in. I'd probably add to that as well. Uh, when you have things that move around the screen, um, it can be distracting as well. Um, so yeah. it's something else to consider, like on a website where things just keep moving or uh, auto playing videos and that kind of thing can have an impact. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. Okay, uh, what's been what's been the best strategy for inclusive design? <laughs> yeah, the best strategy. So uh, I think what Nike is doing is a really good example of a strategy. Um, same with the Aeron chair. Uh, in terms of, I, th I think, uh, and similar with Microsoft as well, they've got a, I haven't talked about it today, but they've got a thing called the adaptive controller. Um, so it's a controller they've created um, to play Xbox for some people who have uh, physical disabilities. Um, so all of those, their starting point was uh, people, you know, it could even be just an individual with a disability, and then they've extended it out to a wider audience. Um, so I think that's a really, really good strategy. Okay, so the goal equivalent experience in quotes uh, is often sought in relation to accessible solutions. Can you talk us through some examples of what an equivalent experience should consist of in terms of inclusive design and uh, common examples that don't meet the brief? Yeah, so I know we're sort of, uh, don't have that much time to, to go on, but I'll just sort of briefly talk about this one. Uh, so I think that point uh, Susan Goldson made, a diverse range of ways, and if we're talking about information, for example, a diverse range of ways to access information. Um, there's a really prominent figure in the design space, John Mader. He releases a report uh, every year um, called the Design in Tech Report. And, uh, you know, five years ago, I think it was a PDF or PowerPoint slides that you just kind of click through. Uh, and I noticed last year, he still had the PowerPoint slides and I think a PDF you could download, but he also created a video. He actually created two videos. One was a 75 minute video of him talking through the slides. And uh, the second video was, I think, a 13-minute 13, 13 video, like a, kind of a short one for people who are a bit time poor. Um, and he also summarised it in HTML form too. Um, I think that was a really good example of how we can present a report in different ways. So traditionally, when we think about a report, it's going to be written, quite often it's put into a PDF. That's not going to be accessible to everybody. Um, if it's not using a technique called tagging, then uh, a person who's using a screen reader who might be blind, might be unable to read it. Um, some people with dyslexia might not be able to read if, if it's lots of text. Um, lots of people might have trouble reading that report. Whereas if you have, say, a text report, and then you have a video, and then you maybe have a H HTML summary as well, then you're providing a real diverse range of ways um, to access that report. Um, so that's a really good example, uh, I think, uh, of inclusive design uh, applied in more of a communications context. Um, so in a, a bad example is, essentially an annual report you get out of most organizations where it's just a PDF and that's it. And some people will just be unable to read it. Um, it wasn't a report, but I know a woman who has dyslexia and she told me to get through school. She would be taking the digital handbook and then copying it into Word and then using uh, a speak setting. So it would read it out to her. And that was how she got into school. And it's how she's now studying medicine uh, at university as well. All right. Uh, how can we encourage inclusive design from the top of the organization down? You've kind of touched on this a little bit, but is there anything else you'd like to expand on with that one? No, I think you just need to figure out uh, what the top cares about. So some top will just care about finances. And in that instance, maybe you'll talk about, you know, growing the market, more people will be able to access our services. Um, or it could be, you know, you might have a CEO who's more empathetic. And um, if you just say, look, there's people out there who can't use this. Um, they might really get behind that. So yeah, I think we've kind of touched on it already um, throughout the webinar and the previous question. But yeah, you've got to kind of figure out what works um, at, the, at the top for your organization. Okay, how can we 
how can inclusive design contribute to better communication strategies? Uh, so kind of touched on it a little bit before with that example um, with the report, uh, the design tech report having a video version and text version and PDF, uh, et cetera. Um, I think that's a really key thing um, when it comes to communication. So just acknowledging that not everybody can read lots of text and not everybody can watch videos either. So we need to kind of think about how we present information in different ways and kind of not there yet fully, but I think technology is enabling a lot of this. Um, whereas previously we were kind of stuck with, you know, paper, paper information or, you know, television and, or radio and that was kind of it. And the last one that was submitted was how do we show that designs do not need to be boring to be inclusive? So I think uh, just take uh, lots of examples out there that um, are good, good designs and uh, sort of a form of inclusive design. So I've got the OXO Good Groups product. They're considered one of the best kitchen products out there. Um, similar with the Aeron chair, one of the best Aeron chairs or what Nike's doing. Or, uh, you know, Tommy Hilfiger are doing some pretty interesting stuff. They've got a adaptive clothing range. And uh, for example, they've got a, um, you know, you can buy a jacket that has a zip that you can zip up using only one hand. Um, my brother has a, a physical disability and I bought him some of the products from um, some of their clothing. And he absolutely loves it because he couldn't do up a zip with two hands previous to that. So yeah, I think um, just by showing them lots of examples that are out there right now, is um, probably the best way to show it's not boring. It's actually really innovative. Okay, uh, so questions in the Q and A. Um, what are the laws and regulations in regards to accessibility, which you also touched on a bit earlier? And are there any guidelines on designing for websites and apps? Uh, well, there's the web content accessibility guidelines, uh, which are probably the most well-known uh, when it comes to accessibility. Um, you've also got uh, Android and uh, iOS developer guidelines. They also have a little bit about accessibility in them, in them as well. Um, outside of that, uh, in terms of guidelines and sort of design patterns, there's obviously the course that I run. So we, we go through a bunch of design patterns uh, through that. Um, you can also look at the Nielsen Norman Group. So they're one of the big usability research companies in the world, and they do have some articles on accessibility uh, too. Um, so that's probably the, some of the good places you could go to. Uh, for guidelines. There was a question about if there's a central reference point for finding an inclusively designed item like uh, homeware, furniture or appliance. Do you know much about that? Uh, so I guess there's two sides of it. There's the like case studies for designers and there are some places that have that like um, I think it's called inclusive design toolkit.co.uk or if you google inclusive design one of the top results um, should be out of uh, Cambridge University out of the UK, they have an inclusive design department. Um, and I guess the other side of it's the uh, purchasing side. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not across too much the homeware, furniture or appliance side of things. I know Vision Australia has a store um, that's aimed primarily at people with vision loss. Um, so that could be one place if it's relating to, to vision. Um, otherwise, uh, I know more about, yeah, more the clothing side, I guess. So Tommy Hilfiger have a range. Um, Marks and Spencer have a, a kids range, I think of clothes, um, yeah, can't sort of give much more information. Apple have an accessibility part of their, their online store. Um, so that has some products in it too. Um, but I don't know if the idea yeah, is essential, just a shop that specializes just in that. We've got a couple of questions about uh, the user groups to consider or usability testing. Um, so I might lump those together. So one question is, how do you draw a line as to how wide a user group to consider um, I think that sounds like it's to do with the actual users of your particular product or service. Uh, and another one about how we find people with disabilities to test uh, products such as online learning. Yeah, sure. So the first one, it's a really, really hard question to answer. Um, it's the, what I tend to say is, is it's going to come down to budget. So say, for example, if your organization has never done usability testing with people with disabilities, um, you might want to just bring in a representative sample. So it might be, you know, for example, two people who are blind, um, one people with one person with dyslexia, it might be one person with ADHD, um, whatever it is, uh, just try to get sort of, I guess, a broad, diverse bunch of people to do the testing. 
you're not going to get you know lots of data that's going to make you really really confident in the decisions but it'll be a huge learning exercise you're going to learn so much through that um, if you have a bigger budget say after you maybe you've done that maybe your leadership team or um maybe your managers said yeah we, should, we really want to invest more into this we're going to give you more budget then um you might actually start to focus on specific demographics so you might say yeah let's bring in you know eight people who are blind um using a variety of screen readers and that might be the approach we take um, but it's going to come down to budget but yeah if you've got a small budget you're sort of just just getting started um, i would tend to say just go for broad and um, those demographics i mentioned at the beginning try to get one at least one person from each of those demographics so um yeah for example a person who's blind um so relate to vision um, you might also want to include someone who's got who's low vision um could be a person yeah, with a physical disability so it might be arthritis to start with but you, you just stand to learn but then you might move on to maybe a person who's got cerebral palsy and they're using their voice um yeah it's probably not gonna be a one-off exercise you're gonna have to kind of build on it over a, a number of years uh, i think we've just about run out of time now so i'll just ask one more question uh what are some uh resources that people can use or websites people can go to to find out more about inclusive design uh, so our, we've got some articles on our blog um, and uh, we're looking to really grow this space so we want to, we want to put out a lot more information uh, that we can um, also follow uh, Sun of Time newsletter if you're not already and um, we're going to be doing lots of future webinars and some of them will be touching on design um, so definitely um, keep that in mind this video will be uploaded to YouTube um, outside of that, uh, we might just follow up the session with an email and I can provide some external links as well um, that, that can have further information on this topic. All right. Um, so there are a lot of questions we didn't get time to answer. So really sorry we didn't get to those. Uh, we, as Josh mentioned, we'll be answering a lot of those questions in future webinars uh, as well. So stay tuned for those. We plan to be uh, putting these on throughout the year. So look out for that. Um, also, uh, we'll be sending out a link to the recording in a few few days, um, so you should get that. Uh, and there'll also be a link to give us feedback so we can uh, improve the way we do our webinars. So please do give us feedback, good or bad, uh, and we'll take that on board. Uh, and otherwise, I uh, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate you all being here for this, uh, our first webinar of the year. Um, it's been great to share it with you. I uh, hope that you were able to get something out of it uh, and um, yeah, enjoyed the content. Thank you to Josh. Thank you, Deb, for helping us run this webinar smoothly. Um, and also, uh, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about inclusive design, as Josh has mentioned, he, he's got his inclusive design course that you can do. Uh, you or your team uh, can do that. Or we've got a bunch of other courses on different accessibility topics for you to, to do. So look out for those as well. And um, yeah, thank you all for your time uh, and take care of yourselves and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone.